Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. This is Mu Zhang from Princeton, and it's my pleasure to present at EC this year. I will talk about a theory of choice bracketing and the risk. So it's common for us to face multiple risky decision problems in the real world, like consumptions in different periods and portfolio choices in different financial markets. However, it's complex to quote unquote rationally aggregate risks from multiple different sources. As a result, decision makers usually adopt heuristics to evaluate such multi-source risk. In this talk, we are going to consider two of them, narrow bracketing and correlation neglect. We start with a very simple experiment on narrow bracketing. There are two binary choice problems. The subject is asked to make two decisions simultaneously, and everything is independent from each other. The first decision is a choice between a short gain and a risky gain. And the second decision is between a short loss and a risky loss. A rational agent will compute the lottery or the distribution over total money summed up across two decisions. And it's very easy to observe an, ob an, sorry, an obvious dominance relation. Actually, compared with the combination of A and D, the combination of B and C will give you $10 for sure in addition. Then it seems reason, reasonable that any sensible model should predict that A and D will never be chosen simultaneously. However, Tversky and Kahneman found that a majority of their subjects choose A and D, this dominated combination together. One possible explanation is narrow bracketing, which states that a decision maker who faces multiple decisions tends to choose an option in each decision without full regard to other decisions. In this experiment, choosing the safe option A in decision one about gains can be rationalized by risk aversion over gains. And choosing a risky option D in a second decision can be rationalized by risk seeking over losses, both of which are quite standard in economics. Okay, so now we talk about the second heuristic, correlation neglect. So in the real world, sorry, in the real world, different sources of uncertainty are usually correlated, like the prices of different assets. However, decision makers have been found to ignore such correlations in different economic problems, like leave formation, portfolio choice, and school choice problems. So despite the prevalence of these two heuristics, they have received very little attention in a choice theoretical literature. One possible reason is that they are typically interpreted as quote unquote irrational biases and is supposed to deviate drastically from the standard benchmark. After all, they violate the dominance as in the experiment. To our best knowledge, we are the first to provide an axiomatization for narrow bracketing and a correlation neglect as simplifying heuristics for multi-source risk. So you may ask, why do we bother to adopt the axiomatic approach? Well, first, it provides a unified framework to study and compare heuristics. For instance, our representation theorem allows for either narrow bracketing only or correlation neglect only, or both of them or neither of them, the rational benchmark. Then you can attribute the differences of behavior of different models exactly to these heuristics and nothing else. Second, we show that these heuristics can be captured by intuitive and simple deviations from the expected utility benchmark. Actually, we have a non-expected utility model by relaxing the von neumann morgenstein independence axiom. In this sense, narrow bracketing and correlation neglect are no more behavioral or quote-unquote irrational than other commonly used non-expected utility models, like the certainty effect and the prospect theory. So this suggests that narrow bracketing and correlation neglect might deserve more attention in both theoretical and applied works. So finally, the axiomatic framework is flexible enough so that we can, we can apply our model to distinct choice domains. For, for, uh, for instance, we can explain experimental findings on narrow bracketing. In the case with background risk, 
we can accommodate the Rabin's critique on expect utility theory and uh, explain risk aversion over small gambles. When different sources are consumptions in different periods, we can study time preferences and financial market puzzles. Let me just give one example. We propose one alternative to the commonly used Epstein-Zinn utility function in the Ronald risk model or other financial models. Our new utility function has the same explanatory power in these applications. And moreover, the new model is not subject to a recent critiques on Epstein-Zinn for its prediction of unreasonably high timing premium, okay? Due to time limits, I definitely won't have enough time to get to all of these, but I'm more than happy to discuss this afterwards in the coffee break or in the watch party, if any of you is interested. So for this talk, that's always assume correlation neglect and study variations on narrow bracketing. Then we will briefly discuss how to explain experimental findings on narrow bracketing. Okay, so that's the introduction. Now let's go to the model setup. It's quite standard. We have two sources of outcomes, one and two. Each, the outcome source in each source i is just a closed interval on the real line that includes zero. Many stories can fit into this setup, like losses, like, like gains and losses of two gambles in the experiment and the worst of consumption spendings in two periods. Then we define calligraphic P as the set of joint lotteries, or we just say lotteries, with finite supports. That is, only finitely many outcome vectors have positive probability. Then, given, given any lottery P, we define P subscript I as the marginal lottery in source I, which is exactly the marginal distribution in source I. We also define a special subclass of lotteries, which we call P hat. So P hat is a set of lotteries whose marginals are independent from each other. So that's why it's a product of the marginal lotteries. And then we call this exactly the set of product lotteries. So finally, our primitive is quite standard. It's just a binary relation on a set of lotteries. Okay, great. So now we start with the, ver with the fully rational benchmark, the expected utility representation. So this is just the standard expected utility representation in a two-dimensional outcome space. And this utility index W represents the preference for, de uh, for deterministic outcomes. As mentioned in the introduction, in this talk, we are going to assume correlation neglect always. In essence, we have axiom correlation neglect, which states that each lottery P is indifferent to the product lottery with the same marginals. That is, the decision maker's evaluation ignores the interdependence of risks in different sources. It's worthwhile to mention that the word correlation here means the general interdependence instead of the mathematical notion of correlation. So equivalently in this case, we can just focus on environments with only product lotteries P hat, like the standard experiments on narrow bracketing and, and background risk. Okay, so our first new model is the expected utility model with correlation neglect. Compared with the rational benchmark, now the decision maker uses the product of marginal distributions instead of the correct joint dis distribution in the evaluation. In this sense, this, this decision maker can ra rationally aggregate risks if they are independent across different sources but they cannot appreciate the correlation. So this is a model with correlation ignact, but no bracketing. Now we jump to the model with correlation uh, with narrow bracketing. For a given lottery, now the decision maker adopts a two-step uh, evaluation process. First, the decision maker calculates the certainty equivalence of marginal lotteries in each source i using a source-specific utility index vi. Then she evaluates the vector of certainty equivalence using the preference over deterministic outcomes, W. So hence, this decision maker narrowly evaluates the risks in each source fully in isolation. In the later application, we will consider a special case as the summation of certainty equivalence using the same risk preference in both sources. 
This utility function is, is suitable for cases like the experiment in the introduction when there's no risk and the war uh, prizes are money and also everything is simultaneous, then the decision maker should be able to sum up the two monetary prizes and calculate the final wealth. The third model consider an intermediate level of bracketing, where the decision maker narrowly brackets only one source instead of both sources. First, we suppose the decision maker narrowly brackets source two. So consider the interpretation where source one represents today and source two represents tomorrow. So this model is called backward induction bracketing because the, the decision maker adopts the following backward induction evaluation process. So the decision maker first reduces tomorrow's marginal risk P2 to its certainty equivalent and V2. And then this decision maker evaluates today's risk P1 by expected utility. So this new agent only narrowly brackets risks in source two. It's worthwhile to mention that this representation combines the ideas of narrow bracketing and the backward induction, and it admits a recursive structure. So this recursive structure will be exactly our focus in the application of time preferences in the paper. Our representation theorem will also allow for a piecewise combination of narrow bracketing and a backward induction bracketing. For example, consider the following piecewise utility function with only two pieces. So if the set she narrowly brackets both sources, otherwise she's backward induction bracketing where she only narrowly brackets risks in source two. So this example is consistent with the following intuition. If tomorrow's stakes are low, I might make today's decision independent of tomorrow's outcomes. Instead, if tomorrow's stakes are high enough, I might be more careful about evaluating today's, uh, today's risk by taking into account the income effect of tomorrow's lottery. So the title is Generalized Backward Induction Bracketing with Correlation Ignite. It's a crazy name, but it just extends this example with two pieces to a, to a general case with countable remaining pieces. That's the only difference. And clearly, this model includes both narrow bracketing and backward induction bracketing. We don't want to make any asymmetric assumption, so we, only, we also have another counterpart with forward induction bracketing. So in total, we have three distinct models with correlation ignite. The expected utility with correlation ignite, where there's no narrow bracketing, or you can say broad bracketing, there's the four, there's a backward induction bracketing where narrowly brackets uh, risk in source two, and there's the forward induction counterpart. Now we'll provide an axiomatic foundation for exactly these three distinct models. So the first set of axioms are quite standard. Weak order, continuity, and the monotonicity. We'll, we treat a little bit and call a combination of them as A1. Axiom correlation exact same as before, the decision maker is indifferent between a lottery and the product lottery with the same marginals. So in this talk, we assume this agent fully ignores the correlation or the interdependence of risks. So now we can introduce our main axiom, weak independence. So this weak independence axiom is defined on a set of product lotteries, that is lotteries with independent marginals. And our axiom contains two relaxations of the von Neumann-Morgenstein independence axiom. As a reminder, this standard axiom in expected utility theory states that the ranking between two lotteries P and Q should remain the same if they are mixed with the same lottery R. The first part of our axiom says that if we fix the same marginal lottery in one source for all lotteries we are considering, which means we are restricting our attention to a special subclass of lotteries, then the independence axiom holds in the other source. So this guarantees that given any fixed background risk, the decision maker is rational and has expected utility. Second, the second part states that the independence axiom should hold locally in a source I where the decision maker does not narrowly bracket risk, uh, does not narrowly bracket risk. So what do we mean by not narrowly bracketing risk? Well, it means that the conditional preference for marginal lotteries in source I 
depends on the marginal lottery what the background risk in the other source. So in this way, we keep made, uh, we keep the independence axiom as strong as general as possible, and just to make the smallest deviation or relaxation to account for narrow bracketing. So we can interpret a narrow bracketing exactly as one violation of the independence axiom. When you don't have narrow bracketing, then independence axiom should hold at least locally. So now we can have our main result of the talk. A binary relation satisfies axiom A1, correlation neglect, and weak independence if and only if it admits one of the following three representations. The expected utility with correlation neglect we have broad bracketing, the generalized backward induction bracketing with correlation neglect, and its symmetric version with forward induction. Recall that axiom weak independence is an intuitive relaxation of the von neumann morgenstein independence axiom, and hence narrow bracketing does not deviate from the expected utility benchmark drastically, although it does induce a violation of dominance as in the introduction. Okay, so now we consider very briefly uh, one uh, simple application. So narrow bracketing in experiments as in the introduction. So re record that subjects might simultaneously choose the dominated combination A and D in this experiment. So to see how this is consistent with narrow bracketing, suppose we, ha we have the functional form mentioned, in the, uh, mentioned before as the summation of certain equivalents. We have the standard gain and loss utility with risk preference square root of X and the loss aversion parameter two. So this functional form is very standard in the applied works. So it's easy to show that with this utility function, A is strictly better than B and D is strictly better than C. And hence a narrow bracketer will, will choose A and D simultaneously. Okay, so let me skip the related literature and conclude. In this talk, we axiomatize narrow bracketing and correlation neglect for evaluating multi-source risk. Our model can explain the experiments on narrow bracketing and <coughs> on narrow bracketing. In the paper, we consider generalization by relaxing axiom correlation neglect. For instance, we can include the rational benchmark. We also apply our model to Rabin's critique, time preferences, and the financial puzzles. I want to again mention this one example. We propose a new model which shares the same explanatory power as epstein zinn in, in typical finance applications. At the same time, this new model is not subject to a recent critiques on epstein zinn for its high timing premium as discussed in Epstein, Fahey, and Streleski. So that's it. I want to welcome you to join my co uh, coffee break and watch party. And thanks for listening.